Vineyard Church Hopkinton. We're glad you're here. Sejam bem-vindo à Igreja Vineyard. Welcome to the Vineyard Hopkinton. We're glad you're here. Good morning and welcome to the Vineyard Church of Hopkinton. We're happy you're here. Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the Vineyard Church of Hopkinton. We're glad you're here. Sí, bienvenidos. Bienvenidos a Vineyard Hopkinton Church. Hi, welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. We are glad you're here. Good morning, and welcome to the Vineyard Hopkinton at home. We are so glad you're here. We're the Clingers. I'm Esther. I'm Matthew. I'm Dasha. Sam. Shmuda. Pippi. Pippinka. Leo. And I'm Rod. We're grateful that you took the time to worship with us today. If you're new, or maybe you've been coming for a while but haven't connected, we would love to hear from you. Go to vineyardhopkinton.org slash connect, fill out the connection card, and we'll reach out to say hi. Engage with us this morning, say hi on Facebook or YouTube, and give a like or comment if Jesus is speaking to you. Last Sunday, using our Trek with Stuff program, we went out to the community as a church and handed out food and groceries to those in need. We went to Milford and Bellingham, and when we get to the location, we set up our sign, and people would come to us, come to the truck, and take whatever they needed. It's really important as a church to help those in need during these tough times. And we're really thankful that you guys are able to provide as much as you do for those around us that are in need. Now, we're going to turn it over to Stephen, who is finishing our series, Stories Jesus Told. Well, good morning. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. Really happy that you're here with us this morning. We're doing church at home this week, so welcome to our house. Uh, I might be a little bit more comfortable than you would see me on a regular Sunday. I don't even have shoes on right now, but I hope that uh, you're comfortable at home, that you're all set up and that we're ready to go. So question for you, how are you doing today? Right now, right here, let me know, how are you doing? No, say it out loud to me, I know you didn't that time. Okay, thanks, appreciate that. You know, the only people you look crazy to was yourself, so you were fine, good. Uh, you know, I think, we're, we're a mix of things, right? Some of us are good, some of us are not good. Some of us are happy, some of us are sad, some of us are angry and we're grieving and we're struggling and we're anxious. Some of us are bored or depressed and just feeling the weight of this time. Others of us are just kind of doing okay. Some of us might got, you know, maybe your eyes are swollen and your nose is sneezing all the time because pollen got yeah, I understand that. That's where I've been a little bit this past week too. And you know what I'd call this time? I'd call it, for lack of a better term, messy. We live in a messy time of life. We're finishing off a series today called Stories Jesus Told, where we've gone through the parables that Jesus taught. Not all of them, but a lot of them over the past few weeks. And we've talked about these parables, and the parables were stories that Jesus told so that his followers could know what he was up to, so that they could know his plan, how he worked, what his mission was in the world. And the parables can be messy confusing and for you and I who are living 2,000 years after Jesus they can be downright uh, exasperating because we don't have the cultural context and the language cues to be able to base it off of but they're not just supposed to be that way uh, one of the earliest references to the parables in the Bible is Psalm 78 listen to what it says Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Parables are given to us to help us to understand more, not just to confuse us. Jesus teach, tells us parables so that we can understand his mission, so that we could see what he's been up to since the very beginning. And this morning, we're going to look at a parable, a parable that's messy. And I think it's precisely for that reason that it is so appropriate and relevant for us to look at this parable. 
We're going to be in Matthew 13 this morning. If you have a Bible, feel free to open up to there. That's where we're going to be. But we live in messy times, and Jesus speaks relevantly, currently, clearly to us in times like ours, just as much as he did 2,000 years ago when he was speaking to his disciples at the very beginning. He's not out of touch. He gets it. And friends, one thing that I want you to understand this morning is that Jesus has a plan, even if it's a little bit messy. Anyone ever had a messy period of your life? <laughs> you know, like for me, uh, my late teens, early 20s were messy. Uh, I stumbled my way through it. My parents did not think that I had a plan at that point in my life. And there's probably a good reason, probably because I didn't actually really have a plan during that time in my life. Uh, I dropped out of college when I was 19 after about a year for no better reason other than I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it and I didn't know what I was doing with it. It didn't feel like it matched what I wanted to do. And so I just stopped going. And over the next five years, and this is where it gets even messier, I went back to college two or three times. I can't remember exactly how many. I think I've repressed at least one of these times because they're kind of embarrassing. Uh, but I went back multiple times. I remember one time I went back long enough that I went to class for two weeks and then decided that I didn't want to go. And so I stopped, but I didn't stop in time. And so I didn't get any of my money back. I had to give up everything for that semester. I made a lot of messy, expensive, not wise decisions during that time of my life. But the thing was, and this is the irony, was that I actually did know what I wanted to do. I did actually have a plan for my life. I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to do what it is that I'm doing right now. I just didn't want to do the work that was required to get there. I had no interest in that until I was 25. And then within a short period of two years, I went to school, finished my bachelor's while still working full time. I followed that up by going to seminary, getting a master's in theology. And here I am now. I'm pastoring. I'm doing the thing that I knew that I wanted to do the whole time. Jesus was working in my life. It was just a whole lot messier than my parents ever would have wanted it to have been. And we live in messy times, right? A time when many are questioning whether or not Jesus is actually at work, where Jesus actually does have a plan or if he's just flying by the seat of his pants. But the good news is that Jesus does have a plan for us, for all of humanity. He's working in our world. It just might be a little messier than we would like it to be. I want to pray, and then we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 13. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for your presence here with us in our homes. I pray that this morning that you will speak to us, that you'll take away distractions, that you'll take away anxiety and frustrations and anger and bitterness and just anything that's flooding us right now. And I pray instead that you will fill us with your spirit. We just ask you to come, Holy Spirit, to fill Fill us right here and right now in our homes. I thank you for your goodness and for the plans that you have for our world and that we can take real joy. We can find real joy in that reality. I just say we love you, Jesus, for yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we're going to be this morning. Listen to this story that Jesus tells us. Here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. But when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds? They asked. No, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let them both grow together until the harvest. Then I'll tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, to tie them into bundles, to burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. A parable about weeds and wheat. 
But the focus of this isn't on the weeds. The focus is on the wheat, lest we get distracted. But I think it's helpful for us to acknowledge the, the proper nouns in this story. The people, places, and things need to be ID'd. And Jesus gives us a little bit of this later in the chapter. So let me summarize it for you. Who's the farmer? Well, Jesus tells us that it's actually him himself. Jesus is the farmer in this story. The field is the earth. It's not good or bad, but it is rich soil for growth to be able to happen in. The good seed? Well, that's the harvest of the kingdom of heaven, or as it's called in other places, the kingdom of God. And it's people coming to know Jesus. And the workers? Well, hopefully that's you and I. It's people getting to know Jesus and then spreading his good news, spreading his activity, his seeds, so to speak, all throughout the world. In the weeds, well, that's the stuff that the enemy plants. Which leads me to a question. Do I actually believe that there's an enemy? And I would have to say, yes, I do. You know, C.S. Lewis is a great author, British author from the mid 20th century, and he wrote this about the enemy. He said, there's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. There are two equal and opposite errors into which we can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve in his existence, and the other is to believe, too, to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in him. The enemy is equally pleased by both errors. There's no neutral ground. It's good and it's evil. It's claimed by one of the two. We'll touch on this a bit more as we go, but if we believe in the ultimate goodness of God, of Jesus, of a God who has a great plan for his earth, for his people, for his creation, then we must believe that there's also an enemy out there who desperately wants to destroy the good things of God, who desperately wants to distract us from encountering the good God who loves us and who has really good plans for our lives and for our world. If we believe in good, then we must also believe in evil. But let's look back to the story and then we'll come back to that. It says that the weeds grew and that the workers realized that something had happened. And what's interesting, and I think we need to grab a hold of this, is that the farmer did not question who did it. There was no investigation necessary. There were no people that needed to be questioned. There was no discussion that needed to happen. The farmer immediately said that the enemy must have done this. There's no question about it. He knew who had done it and why he had done it. It was time to move on to the action steps. The farmer names the enemy right away and calls out what had happened and who had done it. And so then at that point, the only thing left for us is to think about our thoughts about when bad things happen, when bad seeds planted in the midst of something that we've been working on. When evil happens in our world, people get angry, right? And I would say that that's justified, a righteous anger in the face of evil because we, we serve a God who is so good, a righteous anger in the face of that. Is, is necessary, is, is healthy, is, is right. Because we know that God is good and that evil goes against the very character of Jesus. But what often happens when bad things happen, when evil shows up in our world, is that people start asking this simple question, if God is good, then why are bad things happening? And this question only gives us space for a couple of answers. Let me toss these out there to you. The, the answers to if God's good, why are bad things happen are, are these. Either God isn't good or God is good, but he's weak. He's not powerful enough to destroy evil. Or God is good, but he has enemies who do evil things. And for some reason, he allows them to keep doing evil. 
Those are the options that were left there with this question. And a couple of quick res replies to these. For one, I think that the first answer cannot be true. God is good. God is goodness. If you look up good in the dictionary, you're going to see a picture of Jesus. He is the ultimate good. He is the definition of what good means. So I don't think that that can be the case. The second one I also don't think can be the case. God is good and he is powerful. He does have the power and the ability to act in ways that would be the total and complete destruction of evil. And in fact, I would say that he has done that. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The third one, that he's good, but he has enemies who do good things. And for some reason, he allows them to continue is where I would land. But I would add a couple of things to that sentence because that doesn't seem finished. It doesn't seem full enough to me. I would say that God is good. He has enemies who want to destroy his plans and he's wise. He's wise enough to have a bigger plan. When I read verses 28 through 30, my eyes immediately jump to verse 30 where it says, let both grow together until the harvest. And I think, why? Why let them keep growing together? Why not just end this? Why not pull out the weeds right here and right now? You know, for the workers, that's what they said. And I think their issue in mind probably isn't that the weeds are there, because that's to be expected in some ways. Weeds happen. We get it. We understand that there is bad, that there is evil. Their issue, and mine also, is not is that Jesus isn't dealing with it now. Why not get it over right here and right now on my timeline when I want to see it finished, when I'm annoyed when it's making my life harder, when I'm struggling, when people that I love are struggling, when I'm seeing hurt and pain and heartbreak and injustice and oppression and all those things in our world. Huh, Jesus, why not now? Why not get rid of this evil right now? Do you ever feel that? Well, the good news is that there's an answer in this story. Look one sentence before what I just read. The farmer said, no, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. And that changes things. Ripping out the weeds in the early stages will destroy the wheat. There's no chance for the wheat at that point. The weeds, you see, aren't really bothering the wheat. <laughs> They're not choking the wheat. They're not taking out uh, water and nutrients from the wheat. The wheat is still able to grow perfectly fine with the weeds there. The weeds aren't hurting the farmer. They're not threatening the farmer at all. The weeds are annoying to you and I, to the workers. They're painful to us when we're doing the, the work of planting the seeds, of pouring into the things that Jesus is doing. The weeds do bother us. They affect us. But ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, they're annoying. And ripping out the annoying for this uh, right now has the potential to destroy the good. Ripping out the annoying the bad, the evil right now has the potential to destroy the good things that Jesus is up to. Here's why it's dangerous for the workers to pull out the weeds. The word that, uh, the, the, that Jesus uses for, for weeds right here is actually a, a, a very specific weed. It's not a generic word at all. It names a certain type of weed that they would have all known that looked a lot like wheat. And it was long, tall grass with bristles on the end. In the early life stages of this weed, it was uh, almost identical to the wheat. There's a reason that the enemy uses that one to distract them. There's a reason the enemy uses the things he uses to distract us because it looks so close to what God is actually doing. But it is different in the danger if we go to rip out the weeds that look very similar to the good things that Jesus is doing. The danger then is that we might rip out the good that Jesus is doing at the same time. If the workers start ripping out the weeds, they're guaranteed to pull out the wheat at the exact same time. But if they have patience, if they trust that the farmer is good, 
that he's wise, that he has a plan, that he knows what he's up to, then the enemy can be eradicated once and for all. But it requires trust. Listen to what this theologian wrote. Indeed, that puts the finger on the whole purpose of the enemy sowing the weeds. He has no power against the goodness of God. The wheat is in the field, the kingdom of God is in the world, and there is not a thing that he can do about it. Evil, like the weeds, is a counterfeit of a good God. The enemy has no power against the goodness of God. All he can hope for is to sow pain and heartbreak and destruction and things that seem immensely personal and deep in the very moment. But what we need to keep our eye on is the fact that the ultimate is not what the enemy is doing. The ultimate is what God is doing and he's got it worked out. So let's break it down. Jesus is good. He's bringing his kingdom to earth and he's moving throughout humanity. He's sowing his good things into our world. He's sowing goodness. He's sowing kindness and gentleness and mercy and generosity. He's pouring out his love. He's bringing joy into our world. And he has an enemy who will do whatever it takes to bring destruction to his good plans, no matter how futile his attempts are. And God, for some reason, allows them both to coexist. Now, this sounds to me like a chaotic mixture. It's a, a disharmonious sound. It's painful. It shouldn't be allowed. And so much of life feels like that, right? We're stuck in the middle of it. We're living this out day by day. We're dealing with the fight that's going on. And we want Jesus to come and to rip out the weeds so that our life can be better. And sometimes he does. Sometimes Jesus comes and he heals and he brings freedom from oppression. And we see deliverance from evil. Sometimes we see Jesus move in powerful ways that changes everything in people's lives but not always why that is our question why because the harvest isn't ready jesus said let them grow together until the harvest but there's good news in the midst of that the harvest is coming and when the harvest is ripe, things will be finished once and for all. It won't be a lot of little fights. It'll be a one big rip and then it will all be finished. Evil will be eradicated. The enemy will be defeated once and for all. I didn't finish my breakdown of the story from earlier. Jesus is good. He has an enemy who wants to bring destruction to his good things. He wants to distract us. And Jesus allows both of them to coexist for now. For now, they both exist, and yet not forever. Because Jesus will win, and the enemy will lose the weeds. Do not choke out the wheat. They just annoy them. The, the farmer is right, and in the end, he will be proven correct on the grand scale. The kingdom of God, led by Jesus as king, will win. And because of that, we know that he has already won. His kingdom has already come. We're just waiting for the final announcement to let us know that all of this is finished and that goodness of God is reigning supreming over everything in our world. Friends, I said at the beginning that Jesus has a plan. It just might feel messy. And that's the reality. You know, I was talking to somebody in our church, a man named Stephen Morrison, who about two months ago uh, was informed that he had COVID-19 and he went through a rough period. Uh, so I had a conversation with him about what life looked like and where Jesus was in the midst of it. Let's listen in and hear what he has to say. I wanted to talk to Stephen Morrison, Stephen, because uh, in March and April, you went through a... Uh, very relevant, but very difficult uh, medical situation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in April, on April 1st, to be exact, I was just woke up. I was dead tired. My whole body was sore. And I always explained it, explained it to my doctors. It was like getting up. You know, I decided to run the Boston Marathon on a whim 
And then after that, I literally decided to go to the gym and like do supersets with all my muscle groups. Everything was aching and sore. Uh, so something prompted me to say, you know, let me take my temperature. I took my temperature. It wasn't anything big, but uh, I was having problems breathing all of a sudden. And uh, so I called my doctor's office and spoke with them and we went over everything. They, they were basically like, like everything you tell us, it seems like you're, you know, dealing with COVID-19. Uh, and that's when I really was thankful that I am a child of God. And I was, you know, really, really relied on that faith to get me through, especially that day and night, because I was there from Monday, early evening to Tuesday evening. So it was two days there uh, at UMass that it was really, really tough uh, and scary and alone. Were there times, you mentioned this one, but I'm just curious over the next couple of weeks, were there times where you really kind of knew Jesus was there with you in the midst of this? No matter how dark it got, how bad it got, I always felt he was there with me and, and guiding me and giving me the strength. And I felt when I asked for him to give me the strength to get through the day, he was truly there pushing me and encouraging me. Uh, and then there are other things. Now, uh, great. I feel I have one of the best church families around and, you know, some families made some meals and dropped them off. And uh, then some of these meals start popping up and you get that text saying, Hey, let's check your back porch. And, you know, you have your soups or your chilies or, you know, someone made a nice Thanksgiving turkey dinner and it was, you know, took me like three days to eat it, but it was, uh, it was it was good. It was great. And I'm so, so blessed and grateful for that. Just any kind of closing thoughts before we say goodbye? You know, each day was a new challenge, and I just felt God was there encouraging me every step of the way. Uh, and I think our reliance on God during these times is going to really, really get us through us. Thanks for uh, sharing your story with us, Stephen. Appreciate it. Well, thanks, Stephen. You know, I, I really appreciate what Stephen said at the end there. He said that the entire time that he knew that he wasn't alone, that Jesus was with him. And he said that our our, our biggest uh, thing needs to be that we have a reliance on Jesus to see us through. We have to trust Jesus to be with us. What do we do until Jesus returns and all is made right? Well, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We have to trust him. We have to have confidence in his plan and know that he is good, that he is the ultimate good. He's not leaving us alone. He's here with us right here and right now moving in our midst. He's got this and he's going to take care of us. That is the good news today, friends. You know, it makes me think of that great old song, uh, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. My favorite rendition is probably uh, by Aretha Franklin, but there's lots of great versions of it. One of the verses says, Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to your light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. Where are you placing your trust during these days? Are you placing your trust in the goodness of, of, a, of Jesus, who is there with you in the storm and in the night, who is there with you right now, who's with you in your pain, in your frustration, in your suffering? Are you trusting in him in these messy times? That is where we need to place our hope. Friends, we cannot wait for things to just get back to normal. That cannot be our answer to life right now because Jesus is calling us to more. Jesus is here with us right here and right now, and we have to trust in that, that he wants to move in the midst of us. So friends, are you willing to let him? Are you willing to cry out, to grab a hold of him and to say, I'm not letting go. I'm focusing my eyes on you. I am looking to you. As we worship this morning, I want to encourage you, don't turn down the music, turn it up. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and to fill your house, to fill you during this time. Don't just go about your day, but soak in his presence and let Jesus interrupt your plans. 
Friends, Jesus wants to plant good seeds in your life. And in fact, I would say that he already has. If you're here with us, Jesus is already doing something good in your life. Don't let the enemies counterfeit. The enemies fake. The enemy's not quite good enough to actually make anything change on the grand scale. Don't let the enemy confuse you. Take your eyes off of Jesus. Jesus has a plan. It just might be a little messy, but it's going to be good. Will you pray with me? Jesus, in the midst of these messy times, we ask for your presence. Right here and right now, we ask for you to bring your presence, you to bring your confidence, you to bring yourself into our spaces. There is so much heartbreak and hurt in our world, in our country. But even in times like this, we know that our only hope, our only chance is that you are good and that you have really good plans for all of humanity, for all of our world. So we ask for you to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't live 
thank you, Sarah, Matthew, and Esther for leading us in worship. Uh, before we go today, I just want to take some time and pray. Invite the Holy Spirit to come and to move in us as we respond to what he's doing in our lives through the service today. Uh, this past Wednesday, we had a day of prayer for our church and for our community uh, that our church did. Uh, and uh, so I connected with the people who were leading it, some of our, our pastors and other leaders in our church. And one of the encouraging things that kept coming up that I wanted to just share with you is that it was regularly uh, people were saying that they just had this immense feeling that for our church that this is a new season, that God's doing something new and good and he's kind of flipping the script, new things are happening uh, and we just need to be ready for it. Uh, and I'm grateful to hear that. I think God is doing stuff and we wanna be ready and open for him to move. Uh, to all of you who prayed with us this week, thank you for that. We really appreciate it. We want to be a church that really prays together, that intercedes together, and that asks Jesus to speak to us in the midst of life. What I want to do as we uh, begin to wrap up is I just want to give um, two action points for you to respond to. If you're sitting there and you've really been struggling with control during this time, Life feels super messy. Uh, work isn't going how you want it to go. Family's not going the way that you want it to go. Home life's not going the way you want it to go. Your relationships, uh, maybe you're really dealing with a lot of the, the civil unrest, the racial unrest in our country, and it's just really weighing on you heavy. You're struggling during this time and you need grace to be able to trust in the goodness of God in a time when you're not feeling that. I just wanna pray with you. So maybe it's one of the things that I've said, but also it could be a lot of other things, but you're just struggling with control, you're struggling in general, and you want to know the goodness of God in the midst of this time, I wanna pray for you. So if that's you right now, just respond to him and say, okay, Jesus, that's me. I want you to do something. I want you to meet me here in the midst of this time. And I just want to pray for you right now. And, and I want to pray something specific over you. You know, I was listening to, as probably many of you have, to the, the song, The Blessing, this week. It's gone viral, lots of different choir renditions of it. It's really cool. Um, but it's just a really powerful song and it's all based off of some verses in Numbers 6, 24 and 27. And as we end uh, this time, I just wanna pray that over you and then invite the Holy Spirit to come and to bring a deep sense of his goodness and of peace in the midst of the mess of our world. So will you pray with me? Just say that the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to, to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Jesus' promise to us at the end of that section is that, that uh, they will put his name on us and he will bless us. And so Jesus, we just ask for you to bless us to fill us with your peace, to fill us with a, a renewed awareness of your goodness in our life and in our world. Lord, we pray for each person who's saying, yes, I'm struggling with control. I'm struggling with dealing with the messiness. I'm struggling with feeling like it's overwhelming. And I want you to come and to reveal yourself to me. Jesus, I just ask that you will be there with them right there and right now. I just say, come Holy Spirit, Fill them, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. God, I do just pray for our world. Lord God, for our country, for, for this, the many people who are struggling, who are suffering, uh, for the civil unrest that we're seeing all across our country in different cities, for the injustices on, on all kinds of different scales. God, I pray for people who are feeling the weight of this and who are, who are questioning what to do in the midst of it. Jesus, I pray for you to speak to them. Give them your heart in the midst of these times.
speak to us. Show us how we're supposed to respond. Show us how we're supposed to sow seeds of goodness in our world in a time when we're seeing the evil, the, the bad seeds sprouting up all over the place. Reveal to us how we're supposed to live well as your followers during this time. Jesus, we just thank you. I thank you that you are good, that you love us. And we just end by, by praying the words of the Lord's Prayer that your kingdom will come and your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're really happy that you're here with us. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Sunday. If you're new, please say hi, connect with us. Go to vineyardhopkinton.org forward slash connect. Fill out that connection card. Please do it. I want to say hi to you. And following Jesus is meant to happen in community. And I think we have one of the best communities around. So join in, be a part of the good things that Jesus is doing in our church. As we head out, our lead pastor, Rob, has uh, something he wants to invite you to this afternoon, 2 p.m. at the church, all safe and socially distanced. But listen to what he has to say. For now, from our house, have a great week. We're here for you. Bye. Hey folks. Rob Davis here. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and I want to have a gathering at church, outside, at 2 p.m. But for those that would like to, I would love us to gather together uh, for a time of impartation on Pentecost Sunday, expecting that the Holy Spirit wants to impart something to each one of us. Uh, I had this really encouraging um, sense that Jesus, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would like to impart something to us as a church uh, and something to us individually. And more kind of um, encouraging to me was I, I had the sense that the Lord wanted to impart to us new beginnings. So if that sounds appealing to you, uh, if you'd like to gather together with me uh, and just wait on the Lord and just uh, ask for the Holy Spirit to, uh, you know, show up and do whatever and what only the Holy Spirit can do and to have a posture of, uh, you know, receiving, then again, Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m., outside at church. Now, to make this possible... Uh, you need to bring a face mask. It's mandatory. I ask that you bring hand sanitizer, and as you leave your vehicle, you uh, use the sanitizer on your hands. And uh, I was just sort of anticipating you would be standing six feet, six feet apart, but standing around. But uh, if you need to bring a chair, bring your own lawn chair, and uh, you can obviously uh, join us. I think we'll be about, you know, half hour, 40 minutes. Folks, be blessed.